All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15 is where we're going to start out. I want to talk today about modest apparel for Christian women. What does the Bible say about how a woman should dress? And uh, I just want to say one other little thing here, and that is that uh, this message is not really a, re- a reprove or a rebuke. This is more of an exhortation to the Christian women that will be listening here. Now, some of you are probably going to take it as a rebuke, and if you're not right, well, it probably will be a rebuke, but I'm trying to exhort you here. You need to think about what the Lord wants. Okay, The Bible is supposed to be your standard. Amen. But let's get started. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Okay, let me just stop there for just a minute. The word sobriety. What does the word sobriety mean? Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, uh, I'm sorry, shamefacedness. We'll start with shamefacedness. It means bashfulness, excess of modesty. Sobriety means, there's a couple definitions, but we'll go with the uh, third and fourth one here. It says, habitual freedom from enthusiasm, inordinate passion, or overheated imagination, calmness, coolness, as the sobriety of riper years, the sobriety of age. And then the fourth definition is seriousness, gravity without sadness or melancholy. Mirth makes them not mad, nor sobriety sad, is what the definition is there. So in other words, it's a woman is to be not loud, not super obnoxious. She's supposed to be serious and in control, cool, calm. That's what the Bible says. That's not what man says. That's what the Bible says. Okay, verse 11. Let the women, or let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. There you see it again. It's very important. And let me just say this before we continue on. If you are a man, you should go through the Bible and you should see God's instructions to men. And you should say, I'm going to follow that. And the same applies if you're a woman. It's not a thing, oh, the man's trying to tell me what to do. Uh Uh-uh. God's book. And this is instruction in righteousness for women. Okay? Very important to get that. Uh, Now, I just want to go over a couple points here uh, quickly. If you jump back up there to verse 9, it says that her adorning is not to be with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, a lot of women will say, well, then... You shouldn't have broided or braided hair or girls or gold or pearls or costly array. A lot of the some of the holiness people get into that type of stuff. You shouldn't do those things. Well, that's not really what the verse is trying to say. It's saying your adorning is not to be with those things. The Bible's not really condemning those things. It's just saying your beauty should not come from that. See, because if it just condemned those things right there, Uh, Notice it does not say anything about rubies, emeralds, diamonds, silver, platinum, and sapphires. So, you know, if those are the things there that are being condemned, we get away with something that's not there. See, it's not saying that. It's just simply saying your beauty is not to come from what you have on. Okay, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses... 1 through 3. Okay, we have here, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Okay, let me just stop there for just one minute. Uh, One of the attacks, and actually an attack that I answered... Um, this modern preacher named Billy Crone 
uh, he attacked the King James Bible and he said that the word conversation, that you can't understand what that means anymore. Because conversation in the King James Bible always means behavior. And so that's an archaic word and it's not good for our modern day English and all this. That's nonsense. Because you see the Bible also talks about behavior. It uses both words, conversation and behavior. Now conversation can mean behavior, but I think it also throws in the thing of the actual conversation. Okay, It's not just behavior, in other words. It's a, it's a deeper meaning than that. Uh, but let's jump down to verse 3 there. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. So very similar there to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You see the same thing. The adorning is not to be those things. It doesn't say you can't wear them or can't do them. It just says you're adorning Okay, the way that you are, your beauty, in other words, is not to come from those things. Okay. We're going to see this as we get down through there. But I want to look at a, a specific point here, and I, I want to kind of make a point here about this thing. It's interesting. It says, um, the outward adorning of plating the hair. And back there in First Timothy chapter 2, it said, about uh, broided hair. Now, what's the deal with the hair there? What's what's going on about that? Well, keep your hand there in First Peter three, and turn back to First Corinthians, chapter eleven. Okay, First Corinthians, chapter eleven, verse fourteen and fifteen. And uh, you, you get into the thing of, of a covering and, and all this. We're not going to get into that today. Uh, I don't believe in a covering, a physical covering like a lot of the Mennonites and Amish and, and people like that where I believe it's to be the hair is a covering. Um, we're not going to get into that right now, though. But look at verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, right there it says a hair, her hair is given for a covering, not a physical covering on top of the hair. Okay, but notice the, the distinction there. If a man has long hair, it's a shame. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory. It's right there. Okay, that's why, you, you know, I think a lot of women, they... They are very concerned with their hair and everything. It's, you know, why? Well, because it's a glory to her. Okay, so that's why you see the thing of uh, plated hair and broided hair there. And it, the Bible's saying, like I said again, it's not, I don't believe the Bible condemns those things, but it's just saying your beauty is not to come from that. Your adorning is not to come from that. Okay, and we're going to get into this as we continue. But uh, Revelation 9, verses 7 and 8 kind of reinforces this thing of a man's not to have long hair. I'll just read it here. It says, this is in the tribulation time period. It says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So there again, you know, you have these weird demonic things coming up out of a bottomless pit and they have a face of man and the hair of women you say well god doesn't care about the length of your hair if you're a man no i'm sorry <laughs> yes he does and um it's kind of interesting because uh when did things really start to change i mean you know you can go back through history and there were times when men would have long hair and things i understand that but in america the thing that really kind of tipped everything over, not only with hairstyles, but also with clothing styles, would have been back in the 60s and 70s, the whole hippie movement. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of the women started to dress and act like men, and a lot of the men started to dress and act like women. You know, And it really is traced back to that time period. And that's when you started to see a lot of the immodest apparel come in. And we'll hit more on that as we continue here. But what was the big thing with the hippie movement? It was rebellion against God. That's what the whole thing is. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. 
What is that? It's, it's rebellion against God. That's what that whole thing was about. And uh, just kind of an interesting side note here. Uh, I actually heard a buddy of mine had a CD, a uh, bluegrass singer named Lester Flat, and he sang a song called "I Can't Tell the Boys from the Girls." <laughs> and, it, and he said, "And it, and friend, it's really messing up my world." You know, and it talks about how he's a single guy from the country, and he goes to the city to look for a wife. And he said he he keeps you know going up behind people with long hair, and I can't tell if it's a boy or a girl. <laughs> you know, see, it's not supposed to be. And I mean, nature itself should teach you that. You know that it's just a bad idea. Go back to First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, verse four. We'll look at that next. It says here, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now that right there is the main issue for you women that are listening and the women that are here this morning. It's in the sight of God of great price. Wouldn't you want to be that as a woman? Wouldn't you want to be in the sight of God of great price? I'd like to be that as a man. I'd like to, for God to look down and say, hey, that guy's really worth something. I really appreciate what he's doing. See, now this isn't for me here. This is for women. Okay? You look at those portions of Scripture and you apply it to your life and you and you examine yourself, okay, as, as a woman. But First uh, Thessalonians two four, we actually went over this in our Thursday night Bible study. Uh, says a bunch of things there. I'm going to just just going to talk about the last half of the verse. It says, "Not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts." And you'll see that theme throughout the Bible. Uh, Galatians chapter one also talks about not pleasing men. You know. We should not please men. We should be the servants of God and please God. It's right there. That should be your motivation. Now we're going to go back to Proverbs chapter 31. We're going to discuss this in great detail. We'll be coming back to 1 Peter 3 there, but it'll be just a little bit. But uh, what about this thing of a woman of great price? Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. And we have a message on this one. Uh, Brother Jesse Dileski preached a whole message on Proverbs 31. So, like I said, we aren't going to cover everything. Just going to hit a couple verses. But Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Okay? And it's kind of interesting because, you know, if you look at the women that are most esteemed right now in our world, they're the actresses and things out in Hollywood. I call them the Hollywood harlots, not starlets. What's their price? Is it high? No. You know, and you, and you study a lot of these women like Madonna. She just committed fornication until she got to where she wants to be. She doesn't have a high price. She can be bought and sold very easily. She's not a virtuous woman. And if you want to make it to the top in Hollywood, you can't be a virtuous woman. You have to be willing to have a very cheap price. That's the whole thing. And in the sight of God, you know, in the sight of the world, oh, wow, they're really something. In the sight of God, they're nothing. They're not any different than a, a street prostitute in some foreign city or something. That's just the way it is. But look at verse 22 of Proverbs chapter 31. It says, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Okay, she. it's not that as a virtuous woman you have to dress in burlap and, and just be just totally no beauty at all. No. You can dress in nice clothing, but that's not where your beauty is supposed to come from. Your adorning is not to be what you have on, what you put on. Okay, it's not a sin to dress nice and to look nice as a Christian woman. It's just a sin if that's where your beauty comes from. Okay, look at uh, verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Now, a woman down here on this earth, if she's married, she does have a responsibility to her husband to be a good wife to him. 
But in a spiritual application, you also have a responsibility to your heavenly husband, to Jesus Christ. And is he known by your life? You know, I mean, do people look at you and say, is she, she's a good Christian woman? They should. If you're a, a Christian lady, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's very important. Okay? And, uh, you know, another thing that you can, another good question to ask is, if you're a Christian lady, are you true to your heavenly husband? It's good to be true to your husband here on earth. That's, of course, very important. But are you true to your heavenly husband? Also very important. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to see a little bit later, too, about the thing of a virtuous woman. We're going to look at an example in the Bible of a virtuous woman. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 5 and 6. Okay, it says here, For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Okay, and, and again, notice that the adorning there, that they adorn themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. It doesn't have anything to do with a physical adorning. Okay, the beauty there, the adorning, comes from her her uh, relationship to her husband. Okay, very important to understand that. And verse 7, we'll cover this yet before we move on. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So it's not all, you know, you know, if you're a woman and you're listening to this and saying, oh, you know, it's all on me and oh, you know. No, the men have a responsibility too. The husbands have responsibilities as well. They're to honor their wives. So, what is modest apparel? Now, in the two chapter or in the two passages we read, First Timothy two and First Peter three, was there anything mentioned about dresses or pants? No. It was just talking about your adorning. Your beauty is not to be what you have on; it's to be your conversation, your behavior. Okay, that's what it's supposed to be. Now, I'm gonna, just going to tell you right up front. I believe that the a proper, modest apparel for women is dresses and skirts. Now, up until the 1960s, nobody would have argued with me. There would have been no argument. I mean, go back 100 years ago, or even go back to 1950, and say, I believe women should wear dresses and skirts. They'd say, yeah, you know, of course. There would have been no argument. But now, now there's going to be some argument. I'm probably going to offend some women out there. But uh, one of the things that you're going to hear, uh, especially among a lot of the conservative Baptists, which I consider myself to be part of that, uh, but they'll say, women are not to wear men's clothing. You're not to wear that which pertaineth unto a man. So let's look at that. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. And, you know, yes, I understand that that's under the law. I understand that. But, you see, I think that this is just instruction in righteousness. I mean, really, it's common sense. I mean, if you go to the store and you see some man over in the in the women's department, you know, something kind of goes, you know, oh, I don't know about that. What's what's that all about? And he's holding the dresses up and holding them, you know, on himself or something. You, you wouldn't think anything of that. You'd say, well, something's wrong with that guy. But why is it then that a woman can go and put on men's clothing and everybody just goes, oh, well, no big deal, you know? And there are women that, that shop in, in the men's department. Nobody thinks anything of that. 
But a man does it, it's, oh, that's kind of weird. Something's wrong there. See, I mean, and, and let me just say this, too. And I'm not going to do this, but I'll just use myself as an, and as, as an example. Would it change your perception of me if I started wearing a dress, looking like a woman? I mean, I'd make a very ugly woman. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't be a good woman. You know, it'd be weird. But why is it that a woman can dress just like a man and act like a man, and it's just, well, no big deal? See, something's messed up there. Something's wrong with our culture. And there are a lot of cultures out there, by the way, yet, that still the women wouldn't even think of putting pants on. They wouldn't think of wearing men's clothing. There's something to think about. But you say, and, and, and I'll just say this too, God's not for transvestites. Don't ever fall for that, <laughs> okay? I mean, that's just a total abomination. First Samuel chapter 24, you say, well... What did men wear in the Old Testament? Well, we'll look at that. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 4 through 5. We're going to see what they wore. It's kind of an interesting thing here. Here you have the fight between Saul and, and David. It says here, verse 4, And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Now that was a thing in the Old Testament that was kind of a, you're not to discover your, your father's skirt. That's in another um, part of the Bible there. We aren't going to turn to it. But the men in the Old Testament wore a robe and it basically went to the knees or maybe a little bit above the knees. But the bottom portion of that was the skirt. Okay, they called that the skirt. So people say, well, then see, you know, that's that doesn't work out. Well, actually it does. I'm going to show you something else here. Exodus chapter 20. Turn back to Exodus chapter 20. And I'll show you that this actually would apply. It is good instruction and righteousness for a woman. Okay, it says here, Exodus chapter 20, verse 26, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So that tells you the length of this robe that they were wearing. It was fairly short, okay, above the knees. Now, as a Christian woman, you should be careful to have your skirt below your knees. Okay, you start getting the skirt higher up, there's going to be many chances that people are going to see things that they shouldn't. <laughs> okay, you got to be careful of that. So, you know, really the thing about Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, you know, that you're, a woman's not to wear that which pertaineth unto a man, a man, you know, same there. I think that that is very good. I think it's, it's true. I think it's something that you should stand for. Um, I'm not going to be super, super dogmatic about that, you know, because I do know it's under the law and everything else. But the point is, a woman should dress modestly. And we're going to see that as we continue on here. Uh, and let me just say this, too. Would anybody argue that it would be wrong for a woman to wear a dress or a skirt? No. It wouldn't be wrong for them to wear one. Uh, but where's the problem come in at? The problem comes in when they wear one that's too short. And why? Why would what would be the problem with a woman wearing a mini skirt? Well, I'm going to show you what the problem is there. Turn to Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47, verse 1 through 5. We're going to see about this thing. Okay, Isaiah chapter 47, verses 1 through 5. It says here, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy, like, un uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Hmm. Which is what would happen if you had too short of a skirt on. Pass over the rivers. Now look at verse 3. 
Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Okay, as for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. Now, is that a positive reference there, or a negative? Negative. Okay, very negative. Now, people say, well, yeah, but it's the nakedness, you know, that you know the areas are now. It doesn't say anything about what we would call, you know, the private areas. It's talking about the thigh. Make bare the leg, uncover the thigh. And we have gotten so far away from what God expects that now to us we think of nakedness as full nakedness. We don't think of it as an uncovered leg. But that's right there is what God thinks of it. So that's the problem. I mean, that's a big problem. It's right there. What are you going to do with it? And you say, well, what about this thing of the thigh? What's well, interesting, uh, the very first mention of a thigh is in Gen Genesis chapter 24, verse 2. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So, and you see that all through the Old Testament with the men, they were they were swearing things by putting a hand under the thigh. Now, you say, what's the significance there? I have no idea. I don't know what that is. I don't know. I'm not a Jew. I, I have no idea. That's one of those things. I don't get it. But what's the first reference to a woman's thigh? Well, turn to Numbers chapter 5. Numbers chapter 5, we're going to go to verse 18. Numbers chapter 5, verse 18 says, And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of a memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man hath lain with thee, and if thou hast not given aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. Just stop there for just a second. This is this woman is being brought before the priest because there's a, there's a suspicion that she cheated on her husband, that she committed adultery. Okay, let's continue on here. Verse 20. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And guess what? That is the only other reference in the entire Bible to a woman's thigh. Isn't that something? And again, what, what's that all about? I don't know. But there's something there about a woman's thigh. If it's uncovered, God says that's nakedness. If she's committing adultery... He curses it. That's something there. You better be careful about exposing your thighs out in public. That's very... And we are so far away from the from what the Bible teaches, you know, that, that it just seems so strange now to hear this kind of thing. You know, but you go back to the early 1900s. Women back then, if they exposed their ankle, it was considered a sin. It was a big deal. I mean, it... We have fallen very, very, very far. Okay, let's see where we're at here. Um, and a Christian woman, you know, looking at this, they might say, well, I would never cheat on my husband. You know, there's no way. I'm, I'm true to my husband. Well, let's look at that. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28.
Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You say, well, that's a condemnation of men. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But can a woman help that along? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are outfits that women are wearing today out in public that women wouldn't have even dressed that way in the privacy of their own home 50, 60 years ago. You know, I mean, it's it's incredible. Some of the ways that women, I mean, go to a, a, a fair or some kind of a, like we have Green Dragon around here, go there in the summertime. It's just, talk about immodest dress. I mean, wow. Just incredible. But if you're a Christian woman and you're dressing like the world and you are exposing your thighs, your legs, and your clothing is really not covering you all that well, and you cause a man to lust over that, that's a sin. That's a serious sin. And I think you will answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ when you get up there. Say, oh, but everybody else is doing it. That's not a standard for you as a Christian. Never has been. And, and you know, some women will say, yeah, but it's it's neutral. Clothing is neutral. doesn't matter what I wear. You know, it's just the person that's in it. Really? Proverbs chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. I'll read that quick. It says, In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot. It doesn't say she was a harlot dressed in nice clothing. She had the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn. She's not so she doesn't have sobriety or shamefacedness. Her feet abide not in her house. A woman's to be a keeper at home. She's the exact opposite of what God expects from a woman. But it says there she has an attire of an harlot. Okay? There's a book I saw the one time on modest apparel for women, and the book is called Your Clothes Say It For You. There's a lot of truth to that. You see a woman out in public somewhere, you can learn about a lot about her by the way she's dressed. And if you would go to a place where prostitution is legal, like Las Vegas, and you see a woman standing on a street corner, she's going to have as much of her flesh exposed as possible because she's advertising. She's got the attire of an harlot on. If you're a Christian woman, why would you want to dress like that? I mean, you, you know, you got to be right with the Lord in this matter. just want to show you two things here very interesting. I have here uh, Time Life Books, the Old West series, a whole book on the women of the Old West. And right here is a picture. I don't know if everybody can see that. It's a picture of prostitutes from back there in the Old West. And they're dressed like conservative Mennonites. You can't even see any skin. Dresses down to the floor. Isn't that something? And you have modern Christian women. I've seen going to some of these modern churches that are dressed totally immodestly. Dressed showing more flesh than prostitutes did a hundred years ago. I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible how far we've gone. Uh, another thing here, it's interesting how a lot of times a secular person who's lost will sometimes have more wisdom. Uh, the children of this generation are wiser than the children of light, as the Bible says. I have here a book, Tasha Tudor, a famous artist. She made a lot of children's books and Christmas cards and things. And here's a quote from her. She says, Why do women want to dress like men when they're fortunate enough to be women? We get more accomplished by being charming than we would be flaunting around in pants and smoking. I'm very fond of men. I think they are wonderful creatures. I love them dearly, but I don't want to look like one. When women gave up their long skirts, they made a grave error. Lost woman. And yet she's got more sense than a lot of modern day Christian women. It's really something. But now <clears throat> we're going to look at two women in the Bible. Two women that had books of the Bible named after them. First one's going to be Esther. Go back to the Old Testament. 
the book of Esther. <coughs> Esther chapter 2. We're not going to be able to go over the whole story here, but uh, the king puts away his wife because she's uh, not submissive to him. And uh, so we'll look at, and then he's looking for a new wife, basically. So jump down to verse 7 there, Esther chapter 2, verse 7. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her, her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. She was fair and beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that as a Christian woman. Jump down to verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come uh, to go in to King Ahasuerus, <laughs> mess that up, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Uh, twelve months, a full year of Going to a beauty parlor. <laughs> That's something else. Verse 13. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to, her, given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. Ornaments and decorations, gold and things like that is what's being talked about there. In the evening she went and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of She Ashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines, she came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she was called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Hegai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. She didn't go in with all kinds of jewelry and all kinds of things and stuff like that. She said, no, whatever I'm supposed to go in with, that's what I'll put on. Okay. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Okay. Did she have to adorn herself with all kinds of jewelry and everything else? No. She had beauty in the way that she carried herself, in the way she presented herself. God is not against a woman, a Christian woman, woman being beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? And as we read about the Proverbs 31 woman, she clothed herself in silk. So a woman can dress nice, but modestly. Okay? God's not against a woman being attractive. But uh, let's look at the other woman, Ruth. Joshua judges Ruth. We'll go to chapter 2. And again, I can't cover the whole story. You have a Jewish woman, Naomi, and her husband and two sons go into Moab. And there, their sons take wives. And the husband, Naomi's husband dies. The two sons die. Now she's left with herself and her, her two daughter-in-laws. The one daughter-in-law leaves. But Ruth returns back to... Uh, Israel with uh, Naomi. Okay, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elim Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was over, set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? 
he noticed Ruth. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Okay, so notice there, she was out working in the field, but he still noticed her. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute here. But go down to verse 9. It says here, this is Boaz speaking here. He says, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Okay, now, he commanded the young men, Hey, don't mess with her. Okay, there was an attraction there. But it wasn't something that she was dressed in modestly to get his attention. He looked at her and he saw, here's a young woman. She didn't have to come with her mother-in-law. She could have gone and married some other guy from her own country. But she came back with her mother-in-law, so that's good. Now she's out there and she's working hard. There's another good thing. And she's attractive. But let's continue here. Go to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3 verse 1. Then Naomi her mother-in-law said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley to night in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he lieth, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. Okay? Now that's a, that was a Jewish thing there in the Old Testament, the thing of uncovering the feet and we aren't going to get into all that. But the point is, here's a young woman that is looking to get married. She wants to get married. And her mother-in-law did not say to her, hey, you know, if you have it, show it. You know, did, you might want to dress kind of skimpy here to get his attention. She didn't say that. She said, get washed, anoint yourself, and put on decent clothing and go in, you know, to this man. So, you know, here you have a woman that's single looking for a husband. So that would be the type of woman that would be tempted the most to dress immodestly. But she doesn't. Okay, that's a, a great example. Uh, verse 8. Jump down to verse 8. It says here, And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, be, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than that at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Hmm. She didn't care about the money that he had. Okay. Verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Hmm. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far, her price is far above rubies. Here you have a rich man named Boaz, and he's got a lot of holdings and land and things like that. And he sees a woman who's good to her mother-in-law. She's not afraid to work. She dresses nicely, not immodestly. And he says, there's a virtuous woman. She's worth a lot. Okay? Just an interesting thing there. But I want to tell you in conclusion here, I want to tell you about two different girls that I've seen in my life that made a big impression on me. The first one, there was a girl at the church where I grew up, and uh, I'm not going to say her name. I think I kind of remember her name, but I won't say it. Uh, she might have changed. I don't know. But this girl, I think she wanted to be a man worse than anything in the world. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I ever saw her in a, in a dress or a skirt. I remember the one last time I ever saw her, I was at a hardware store down there, near where I grew up, and I saw, I thought it was a guy walking in. 
jeans on, you know, work boots, dirty, white shirt, sleeves rolled up, you know. And I, I saw this guy walk by me, you know, real manly walking and stuff. And I thought, you know, I wonder what that guy's problem is. He's kind of walking real deliberate. And I looked and I thought, oh, that's that girl that I went to church with growing up. And, you know, I mean, she just, there was nothing feminine about that girl. Now, what's at the root of that? Is rebellion. I believe that that's rebellion. I mean, if you, you know, have a lower voice as a woman or something like that, well, you know, you should still try to be a woman. I mean, there should be a desire in a woman to want to look pretty, to want to wear a dress. I don't understand why a woman wouldn't desire those things. And I think that when a woman says, you know, it's it's one thing for a woman to say, I'm going to wear pants because I'm going on a motorcycle or I'm going on a horseback ride or something like that. That's one thing. You know, I'm not going to argue too much. But when a woman says, I will not wear a dress or a skirt, I refuse. I will not. I don't want to wear it. I think something's wrong there. I really do. I think something's wrong. But then the second girl that I saw was up here. There was a farm. And there was a Mennonite girl walking out of the barn. And she was just dirty. I mean, she must have been cleaning out the stalls or something in there. I mean, she just was dirty from head to foot, you know, and, and it was in the summertime. But that girl had a beauty about her in spite of the fact that outwardly she was just filthy. But she carried herself like a lady. She had a, that femininity there. Just the way she walked, the way she was just acting in things, the way she was talking to the people there. And I just thought, in a, in a way, she was very, very beautiful. In spite of the fact that outwardly she was very dirty. See, there's, there's just something there where a woman, I just, man, I feel a woman should be in a dress or a skirt. Now, you know, you can make arguments, well, what about, you know, like I said, about a motorcycle or or hiking or whatever. Yeah, you know, you could make arguments. I mean, the main thing is, do the pants that you wear, if you say you have to wear them, do they show off your thigh? Are they so tight that there's no room for imagination? If that's the case, I think it's wrong. Not think it's wrong, I know it's wrong. And as a Christian woman, your desire should be in line to be in line with this book. And if you're not in line with this book, well, that's between you and God. And you can get mad at me and you can say, you know, I'm a radical, sexist, whatever or something, but you're going to have to deal with God. You're going to answer at the judgment seat of Christ, whether you're right or wrong. So, and you know, and it comes to a point too now where it's more about conforming to the world. And a lot of women, they don't want to think about wearing a skirt or a dress all the time simply because, well, nobody else does it, and I'll look out of place. Well, there again, not a standard for a Christian. As a Christian, you are to be separate from the world. And you have to understand, we are in a time period where God is about ready to pour out his wrath on this planet. So what the majority are doing is wrong. And, you know... I thank the Lord that I was raised in this county because there's a lot of modesty here yet in this county, Lancaster County, where we're at. You know, I have my issues with the Mennonites and the Amish and charity ministries, but I appreciate their modest apparel, the women. I appreciate that, you know. So that's something to think about this morning. If you're a Christian woman, go through those scriptures and ask yourself, am I really dressing modestly? Am I dressing in a way that is pleasing to the Lord? So that's it for this morning, and I thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701, 
Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.